Hello and welcome back to the lab. It is finally back from Keithley. Keithley did not have it forever, just with everything that was going on. It took me a while to get it sent off. Um, they had it for a week-ish, is how long it took. That was shipping included, shipping, alignment, calibration, and everything. I haven't started it since I got it back yet, I just got the power and the data plugged in, so let's see what happens. It's taking a minute. There it goes. Well, based on that update rate, uh, I can say my settings have been blown out, which wasn't, which isn't too, too surprising, given that one of the things Keithley does when you send a meter off or any device off is they do update the firmware to the latest unless you tell them not to. So with firmware update, I'm going to have to set up some things. Obviously, update rate is absolutely insanely fast. That's not a trick of the camera. That's really how fast the meter's cranking. That won't be useful long term because it's not at its highest accuracy when it's moving that fast. So I thought I would do a presentation on what you get and what to expect when you send a moderately high-end piece of test equipment out to the manufacturer for alignment or calibration. In this case, I sent it out for calibration. That did not include an alignment at all. Um, with starting to get into this type of gear, what I do on the channel or what a lot of the historic videos are on the channel, those are alignment procedures, not calibration procedures. So I'm doing the adjustments to tighten up the scope specs and bring it in to um, get as close as I can. A calibration, if it is in, if it meets specifications, especially published specifications, they won't adjust anything on it. They'll, they'll just say, yep, meet specifications and send it back. That also depends on what you order when you ask the manufacturer to do the calibration. In my case, I ordered it. I ordered an, an accredited calibration with data because I wanted to get the data for the channel. Also, with this being the most accurate piece of equipment in my lab for many things, um, ohms, volts, amps, uh, not frequency, but capacitance. I need this meter to be as accurate as I possibly can, and especially continuing on with the 475 series that I have running right now. I will need this along with uh, a good chunk of the rest of the lab to finish up that DM44 on top of the 475A. So I did... Um, one of the reasons why I haven't done anything like that is I this meter was out of, quote, cal. It wasn't verified because I, I had owned it for over 12 months. So it's on a 12-month cycle. As the meter's new, it's a good idea to have those be very frequent. As the components age and they kind of settle down in the meter, you can extend the calibration interval to something longer. So I'll probably push it out to a year and a half, maybe two years. But the problem is you have to keep track of everything because if I did an alignment for someone based on the accuracy of my 7510 and my calibration cycle was, say, five years, six months after I get it calibrated, I find out um, I, do, I do an alignment on a meter for somebody but then I send it out for Cal, and it comes back, it's bad. One of the ranges is out, not working. Everything I've done in that five-year period is suspect. It's not confirmed. So for the alignment procedure, I need to have confidence in the equipment that I'm not going to get burned that way before I do that. So what i got to do is, as the components age, they're... They'll drift a lot when they're new. A lot is relative for a seven and a half digit meter. It doesn't take much to throw it out of alignment or calibration. 
But as the components age, they'll settle kind of into a routine and then the meter won't change much. Um, perfect example is everything I've done on this 7603. This is old enough where a lot of the components, unless they're stored very poorly, um, are done drifting. They're not going to move much from their current values. Now, if I put this in, say, if I pulled one of these plugins out and threw the plug-in in a garage, all bets are off. The high humidity, the high heat, the temperature swings, positive and negative, very hot to very cold. They can all do things to the components in here that will kind of skew that. So that's only true for temperature-stable humidity stable conditioned environments inside a house inside a lab everything's okay also for some of the resistance standards when you do an alignment on those ambient temperature has a lot of bearing on what the measured resistance is especially when you're getting into seven eight digits of resolution you can actually watch um i might do a demo with that just with the resistor um, you can watch the resistance change with temperature. And when you get one of the resistance standards, what you'll get is a, uh, is a calibration sheet. And I think it's a 10 or 20 degree C range is what you end up with. But they'll have what the resistance is, and then they'll have it measured at every degree for like a, a um, 10 or 20 degree sweep of ambient. So, because the resistance will change. So that way you, you have to know the room is 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And then you look at the chart and go, okay, it's 75. This is what the resistance should be for those resistance standards. Because they're completely passive. There's no electronics or anything in those. It's the primary resistance standards are an incredibly high quality resistor, if not multiple incredibly high quality resistors in a box that's all they are it's a ten thousand dollar box but that's it that's all it is <laughs> um so and you definitely don't want to take one of those and use it as a load because if you if you if you dump load current through one of those resistors forget it the calibration certificate isn't accurate anymore it's void because of some hysteresis changes and things like that so that's the long explanation of why you usually calibrate a meter in the short term versus and then and then you can extend the interval as the equipment ages um the 7603 is probably done moving i'll check it a few more times and then it'll be done i have not sent the 6500 out for calibration um i might try to do that in house because we have the 7510 i might send that one out i'm not 100 percent sure it's also less critical for me to send out the 6500 because this is truth for the lab. So I can do troubleshooting, I can do monitoring and things like that with, with the uh, 6500 and kind of use it as an everyday meter. And then when I absolutely need the accuracy, like I'm doing an alignment for another individual, I'm aligning some of the calibration gear that I'm using for the scopes, things like that, I'll use the 7510 that's under under calibration. Essentially what you get when you send one of these out for alignment is you get the meter back, obviously, and you get some paperwork. So let's take a look at the paperwork. This particular piece of paper has been trimmed. There was a lot of personal information on the top. Um, but they do caution, especially with these 6500s or 7510s, that they will blow out all scripts and, and um, other data because they will upgrade the firmware. Just know if you have any scripts or anything stored in the meter, custom settings to back those up before you send it. The important part is the repair description because Keithley runs this through their RMA process, but they perform the accredited calibration, upgraded the firmware to um, 1710B or 1710B, and all ranges on as received data are within published specifications no adjustments necessary what that means is they didn't change anything it would not have 
nothing changed in the meter sending it out to Keithley and get it, getting it back other than I now have confidence in the measurements that it's telling me and that it is working correctly and in spec. So they didn't they didn't make any they didn't tighten up any of the ranges, they didn't do anything. They made no alignment changes to the meter. They just did a calibration. They verified it against their um, some very expensive pieces of equipment and um, said, yep, it's good, and sent it back. So I'm sure most of this was automated because the, the report that I got back, they did 179 range tests on this meter to make sure it, it, it met all of its published specifications. So I'm sure a lot of that was scripted. They have a, they have a streamlined process where they just hook it up, push go, and it send some equipment and meters driven by the automated system and it just does everything it's supposed to do but this is the other paperwork I got and using the book scanner that was in the previous video I was able to digitize some of this and I'm gonna start keeping a record because every time I send it out I'm gonna get this report back and I'm going to add it to my Excel document, and it's going to, I'm going to watch the drift over time, so we'll be able to keep an eye on the meter and just see how one's drifting over time. I did get the accredited calibration on here, so I also got some uncertainties because you can look up this 17.025 ISO standard and find out exactly what they did for the accreditation, but um, this data I will also save. This will go in a binder in the lab. Just so, the, just so that I have it. So the other very important piece of paper that I get is I get the equipment used. So what this does is this tells me the make or the model and the serial number of all the equipment used at Keithley to align this or calibrate this meter. Who the manufacturer was, um, IET, Keithley, and some fluke stuff. But it also shows me when their last cal date was and when their last due date is. What will happen, I'm sure Keithley maintains all this equipment very tightly, but if one of these ever comes up suspect and it's in the cow window where my unit is affected, I'll get an email that says, hey, we need to see your meter back and they'll re-verify it for me. So like if something happened with the 5720, they'll evaluate whether if it affected my meter and if it did they would um, they would let me know so for this meter only being a year old the fact that it's intolerance that just means I haven't made any mistakes and tortured the front end um, I expected it to be in intolerance with it sent out so no adjustments were necessary and it was sent back we'll take a look at DC volts just because so I have a what the test was, 100 millivolts, 100 millivolt range, full scale, but then they also tested half, half scale readings, but then they also tested negative half scale and full scale readings. So just on the 100 millivolt range, we have a positive full scale, positive half scale, negative half scale, negative full scale. And it went through and it said what the nominal value should be. I have a low limit, measured value, high limit, but then they give me an uncertainty based on the piece of equipment that was being used, what its measurement uncertainty was, and we have units, and then whether the result was pass or fail. 179 tests were performed on this meter to verify its specification and accuracy, which, after getting this report back, actually kind of boggles my mind. But um, everything was passed, so they tested. Uh, this is a this is an eight page report, um, page two of eight, about just what the meter did and its ranges. I've simplified this onto an Excel document. Did a table. This was and here's the what I'm going to do is I'm going to have 2022. The next time I send it out for calibration, I'm going to add a row. And I'm going to do the as measured for 2023 and so on as I go up the rail so I can monitor how the meter's drifting over time. And 
I'm still fighting with Excel to try to graph this in a good way. I'd love to see the range and then the, um, the measured value, how it coincides with the limits. So I can keep an eye on it, make sure, see if something's drifting really close to a spec limit. But yeah, this will give you an idea of just how many tests were done. I, I got rid of the uncertainty on this one because that could change depending on the equipment used in the calibration. So for my long-term tracking, that wasn't needed. I also posted this into the metrology section of the EEV blog. Uh, those guys tend to like information like this, and I'll be continuing to do so. I will also leave a link to this document if you want to take a good look at it. In the description below, it'll point to the EEV blog to my post where you can grab the Excel document and download it and take a look at it. Um, it is not representative of all 7510s. It is only representative of my 7510. So this data is only good for that meter, but it will give an overall, at least I have a sample size of one, how the um, meter's drifting over time. So they did DC volts, AC volts at 20 hertz, one kilohertz, 50 kilohertz, and 100 kilohertz, um, all the way up to 700 volts. We did frequency up to 500 kilohertz at 5 volts. Uh, dry contact resistance. This is, um, I believe these are the resistance standards, or dry circuit resistance. I have to look, Actually, I have to look up what this dry circuit resistance is because that's not the resistance range. I have to go in, and um, here's the resistance ranges. Oh, and I should also note that on the DC volts, yeah. So if you look here, like the 10 volt range, they test plus half or plus full, plus half, minus half, minus full. But then they also test the digitizer plus full, plus half, minus half, minus full. So they have to test the 10 volt range four times, four times, twice <laughs> to, to get the full functionality of the meter. Uh, we have good DC current. Microamps all the way up to full amps, but then they also test the 10 volt range. So from here all the way down this page to here is just testing the current ranges of the meter. That's how many tests there are for current range. And then here's the 10 amp range. So this is just the 3 amp range. <laughs> and then they do test capacitance 10% uh, of scale, 70% of scale, and full scale. So one little artifact that I have to delete. This is uh, from the scanning. So the way I got this out of the report was I used the book scanner that was in the previous video, and I did a uh, OCR on it, and the OCR was really good. It helped me clean up the data. I was thinking I was going to have to type all this stuff in. It would have taken me about three or four hours. But um, with the scanner, it took about 30 minutes with a little bit of data cleanup. Um, it did not like one thing to note was it struggled with the minus sign sometimes, like um, minus sign would show up this cube. But then um, UF, the OCR grabbed NF as picofarad instead of nanofarad. So there was a little bit of data cleanup I had to do, but I'm just glad I didn't have to type this whole thing. So next year, we'll add a column, and we'll see how the meter does over time. Thanks for stopping by the lab. Taking a look at the uh, what you what comes back when you ask the manufacturer to calibrate a high performance meter. In this case, I got good news. So the meter came back exactly as I sent it out with a whole bunch of data added to it. So, which is perfect. If there's any questions, leave them in the comment below, and I will see everybody in the next video. As always, more is on the way.